And all he knew was law and punishment and um, justice. <clears throat> and he put everything into that, essentially. And, and in a lot of ways, <clears throat> his interaction with Jean Valjean at the end was very telling. You are always what you have always been. You want a deal? You, you, uh, you steal what you want? And he thinks and sees Valjean in exactly the same light he sees himself, which is exact, in a lot of ways exactly what shame does to us. Is it, it creates this image, <clears throat> created in its own image. And then you have Valjean's response, which is the voice of grace. There is nothing I desire from you, no bargains, no petitions. You are free, and that is such a good deal that it is impossible for us to believe it, and therefore we convert it back to something we know. And that's why the scandal of grace is what it is. And that's why a class like this, why we have these kind of conversations that we do, because in spite of the fact that we think we know grace, certainly from a salva salvation point of view we do, but when it comes to living day in and day out, not as much. So, <clears throat> the one thing I want to make clear, I am not going to try to address this theologically. <clears throat> that would be futile. Brains far smarter than me have done that. But, <clears throat> I do want to talk about grace that's needed to live life differently. In other words, <clears throat> what happens at the point of salvation, what difference does it make the rest of our lives? And it doesn't diminish the other at all. It doesn't diminish it at all. And like I've said to you before, we've got to be really careful that we don't think dichotomously. If it's this, then it's not that. Because we can say that, that the grace justified by grace as a gift of God that allows us to have a right relationship with him, absolutely, we can nail it. But then, what difference does it make the rest of your life? You spend the rest of your life trying to prove that you're worth it? Because when we do that, we're insulting the gift giver. And I, th th we don't think of it in those terms. A lot of times people will discuss, talk about it in terms of, well, I'm just trying to live into what was given me. And that's, that may be true, but the methods by which we accomplishment, accomplish it <clears throat> stand in the way. So, what is grace? Here's one, one something to consider. Grace is the beginning of our healing because it offers us the one thing we need most to be accepted without regard to whether we are acceptable. And that includes not only from ourselves, but it also includes in terms of the world around us. We, we have split ourselves into saying what we believe and then living what we really believe. And that is that the, the bottom line is, is that I've got to do something in order to be acceptable. I have to trade the people around me uh, something in order to find myself acceptable. So grace, the interesting thing about it, and, and it's something that I have begun to say more and more, is that grace creates a space, a space for freedom, a space, a space for us to actually learn a new response to things and actually a way to learn about ourselves. And that's, that's a bigger deal than we can ever imagine, really. If you, if you watch or you, you p kind of pay attention or just monitor your own response to when you do something that disappoints you, Pay attention to what that response is, because in a lot of cases, that, that is where the point of attack is. <clears throat> because Satan is no dummy. He is, he is no dummy. And when it talks about in, in uh, various parts of the New Testament that he has schemes, it doesn't mean just for mankind. It, it does mean specifically for you. And the one thing that's common to all of us that he really loves to turn up the volume, and that is this issue of shame. Because it, we imprison ourselves. He doesn't have to do it for us. 
we imprison ourselves, and we, we manage to do that ourselves. So we're not going to learn something in a prison. We will learn something under the, the conditions of freedom. We, we're not so sure. I think most of us are not so sure that we will. So therefore, we prefer and go toward that which we know. So there are a number of ways that we experience grace. The first one is, is we experience it as a pardon, <clears throat> as forgiveness. We are forgiven for the wrongs we've done, and ultimately this experience of grace is really the answer to our guilt. If we make the distinction, and we'll do this more next time when we talk about shame, if we make the distinction between guilt and shame, guilt is about your performance and shame is about your person. So therefore, when I experience grace as pardon, it is, it is an answer to my guilt. That's why grace creates a space for us to learn how to do something differently. If I do something wrong and I'm already condemned, how am I going to learn anything? So we experience it as a pardon and we experience it as acceptance. And this is the answer to shame. Because shame is the attack on our person. And, and the remarkable thing, when you really think about it, you know, in terms of how, how we're attacked, if you will, in the spiritual domain by Satan, all he has to do is reframe words that mean something to our, our salvation in Christ, like love. So he'll reframe it from a freely given love in grace and turn it into a contractual love that is traded between two people in sex. It's an example of that. Same way with grace. It gets to be such a common word that it means absolutely nothing. And so all he has to do is reframe the words and get us to believe that it's something other than it is, and he doesn't have to do anything else. We just do it for him when it comes to a lot of these things. So, so the idea of acceptance is a direct answer to the idea of shame. And that's, Brene Brown has been touching on it all along. The problem is, is that when, when we talk about self-acceptance, it's not self, self-absorption and it's not self-love in the, in the kind of bastardized sense of the word, but self-acceptance as what? I have been accepted. And what does that mean? And what does that look like and what I actually do in my relationships? There are a couple other things. We experience grace as power. This goes toward the idea of it giving us the power to do something differently. See, if I see, if I do something wrong to whomever, whatever person that I'm in relationship with, and I say, I'm so, so sorry, I hurt you, I know I did, I will never do it again. There's no power there because you're making a promise that you can't keep. So when I say, I'll do everything in my power not to do it again, doesn't say that I won't, but it does create a space for me to catch how I do those things and what kinds of things I tend to do that will interfere and uh, disrupt my relationship with somebody. <clears throat> The thing that you that you can apply within this is this 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 is kind of a three pronged thing, which is kind of interesting because in light of the Trinitarian relationship, but our relationship with others, our relationship with ourselves, and our relationship with God, and all of these things enter into it because the the idea, if you will, that God gave us this gift so that we could truly be free to be in relationship with him, not to, to create a ladder so that we can gain it in some kind of increasing spirituality, but, but a space to become intimate with him. And that's what grace makes possible. So let's look at it in terms of everyday life. A couple of, a few observations I can make for you is that grace is directly related to growth. Children grow in the context of grace, and, and they don't even know it. It's the moment at which 
Shame enters the picture, and sooner or later they make the conclusion, or it's implied to them one way or another, that there's something wrong with them because they did something wrong. And at that point, growth begins to stumble along the way. And we'll look at this in more depth when we start talking about the stained glass self. But children grow in the context of love and grace that they know nothing about, and it's only in that freedom that they really are truly able to fully flourish as individuals, which also gives them complete freedom to be absolutely silly beyond measure. makes adults just laugh out loud. But why? <laughs> because of, of just the, the love that, that they have for them. And, and it, we adjust our expectations accordingly. And the grace that's offered them is not saying there's not anything wrong with them. They're being kids. So grace encourages growth because human limits are accepted. Now, if we reject our own limits then we're already in, in, in a bind. But grace encourages growth because it accepts that we are limited as humans. This is not, hear me really clearly, this is not an excuse or winking at sin that I'm talking about here. It has nothing to do with it at all. We're not talking about, you know, like Paul says in, in Romans, should we sin all the more so that what? Grace may abound. And he says, heavens, no, it's stupid. It doesn't even compute. But if we're already judging our human limits, our human limits, we are not talking about sinful behavior, our human limits, we're already in trouble. Because we insulate ourselves from grace by doing stuff like that. And grace a lot allows for, you may have heard this phrase before, crockpot growth rather than microwave products. It takes time. If you've ever been camping, it's the Dutch oven approach. You don't carry a microwave along with you. And, and that means time. And we hate time. We hate time. Because we want it done now so that, why, why am I not looking forward to PT? Because it takes more time and pain and things I really don't want to go through. That's us. That's always us. I don't want to put the time in it. And quite honestly, if you were there in the exam room when I was talking to my doc, I said, Quite honestly, I know what's going to come out of this anyway. I don't want to put the time in to do it. Just cut it up, fix it up, and leave me alone. Now, how much is that a life philosophy? For a lot of us, even spiritually. Some other observation. Grace allows the space to make mistakes. It allows the space to make mistakes. I have two little swirling demons running around in my house at least twice or three times a week. One's named Grayson, the other one's Desmond. Des, I lovingly refer to him as Jack-Jack. He is our version of Jack-Jack. He makes a straight beeline once he comes in the house. He makes a straight beeline for me once he gets his whatever he's looking for from me. And then he makes a straight beeline for anything he can pull down or touch, or throw, or unpack, or hit the dog with, or whatever. <laughs> yeah, he's done that. Yeah, I mean, my coat is not the sharpest stick in the in the the, the stick thing. Um, <laughs> he's he's not the sharpest knife in the drawer. Let's get it right. And at this time, he's getting a little old. You know, he's in his seventies now, so he doesn't quite hear right. And when Des comes rolling in the door, he, you know, he, Coda goes straight for him. It's like, why do that to yourself? <clears throat> and, 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 and Des will just cold cock him. It's like, get out of my way. I got stuff to do. But guess what? We're not getting mad at him. He's a kid. He doesn't know any better. 
The problem is, is we hold ourselves to a standard that is undefined and always drifting up. So we're always making mistakes. And then we condemn ourselves for not knowing. So it encourages the risk to try something new, and it accepts the fact that learning always includes learning failures. <clears throat> when my kids were little, uh, we used to live in Upper Michigan, and we, f we would heat our house with a wood-burning stove. It was in the middle of our house, and we had a railing around it to try to you know, keep Corey away, my oldest. And you know, every kind of the routine when I would come home from work is – is we I would load it up for the evening and and kind of crank up the heat and everything else because it had to last through the night and it it reached somewhere around 800 degrees really easily very easily but it wasn't at that point but the railing was open and Corey decided to touch it all right now it wasn't real hot it didn't create any welts don't worry I'm not abusing my children or anything like that but it was enough to shock her all right it was it was hot enough to really get her attention and. It was a failure in learning. One trial learning, I would have you know, because the next time I came and started loading it up, she walked around by the, the, the stove with her hands behind her back. It's like, I ain't going to do that again. <laughs> but that's what learning takes, right? And grace creates this space for us to have a failure in learning for it not to be fatal and then to be able to learn. Now, it might take us more than one trial learning, but still, it's, it's all very much a part of that. So <clears throat> there's also this issue of grace and forgiveness. And a lot of times, a lot of writers will talk about grace or forgiveness as, as this kind of overflow or this expression of grace. And on that, on that point, I would agree. Forgiveness is an expression of grace. You saw it even in... In the, in the movie clips. But it's an acceptance of human weakness and limits. Part of the reason, I think, in a lot of ways that we get forgiveness so tangled up and upside down is partly because of our sense of, of shame around doing something wrong and owning up to it. And we'll talk more about this later, but the idea of forgiveness always includes repentance and always includes, well, at some point it can include reconciliation. It doesn't guarantee it. No more than God's offering of forgiveness to humanity guarantees the, their reconciliation with him. So, but forgiveness is, is offering something to someone that I, can, that I, I couldn't afford <clears throat> which is what I put here, <clears throat> is giving away what we couldn't afford to others who can't possibly repay the offense that has occurred. Henry Nouwen just defines forgiveness as love practiced among people who love poorly. <sighs> forgiveness doesn't require shame. Forgiveness requires acceptance. The funny thing about it is, is Jean Valjean, in the movie, never seeks out Jovert to say, I forgive you. But in that moment in time, he enacted forgiveness. And what motivated it? His response to the grace of his soul being, listen, listen to the symbolism, okay? His response to the grace that was offered him because his soul was bought by a bunch of silver, that doesn't have any biblical symbolism, does it? The funny side story to that, some of you may not know that. I mean, my uh, one of my good friends is, is a devotee of all of the, the very philharmonic versions of Les Mis. And the guy that plays the priest in this movie actually was, in his younger days, Jean Valjean in, in the London Philharmonic's version of it. As he got older, and because his, his voice was so remarkable, he turned into becoming the priest, and they brought him into, into this movie as well. The other little side note is that if you actually read Victor Hugo's story, the priest 
was 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 literally appointed a bishop. He didn't go through all the. He got it partly because he he had contributed so much money to the church, and you have a man that offers grace in proportions way out of what you would probably find a a, a typical priest to do. <clears throat> so, some other places, grace and self acceptance. The challenge of self-acceptance is accepting this gift as it's given and not putting conditions on it because that makes it more comfortable to us. I mean, imagine for just a second, it, last Christmas, you gave something to nephews or nieces and their parents talked to them at the door, said, go up and ask your auntie, what do you owe her for it? And you'd be downright scandalized at the notion of that. Because the gift is given to, to convey dignity and honor and specialness to the person, not to create a ladder for them to, to pay back anything. So it cultivates humility and need, and it also commits to learning instead of knowing. Now, that's an odd thing to say at an academic institution. Because your business is supposed to be knowing things, right? <clears throat> but ultimately, the challenge is, is learning in some ways is not the, the static place of knowing. Learning is always increasing. It's always responding. And if we can find a way to grasp the kind of grace that we're being offered, we will always learn. And we'll learn even from people that mean us harm. Which seems remarkable, really. And and actually, in some respects, we show a greater level. Remember, experiencing grace as power, we show a greater level of power by somebody who means us harm, and we still learn from them. I, I I think there's something remarkable about that. That's not in our nature to do, and it, it's an important part of this. Now, let me. Let me. I'll I'll end on this, and and uh, we'll carry it over because it's all part of a bigger presentation. But what this is something that I refer to as grace and the well. And what do I mean by the well? I've talked about that in this class before. That shame would have us pay attention to all the downstream behaviors that are wrong about us and convict us and say you will always be what you've always been. But grace gives us the ability to walk back upstream and get to the well, for from it flows the well springs of life. And in that well, we can care for it because we're not condemning ourselves or being condemned. We are actually creating the kind of conditions in which the heart being well cared for, behavior flows from that downstream very naturally. But it's easier to pay attention to the downstream behavior stuff than it is to kind of fight our way back to the well. And the well is, of course, our heart and what we do with it. Grace brings life to the well. Now, what does that mean? It means it gives us the power to clear away all the things that oftentimes infest that thing so that will it clear up downstream instantaneously? No, it won't. But over time, things do change, just like you saw Jean Valjean. Because in the state that he was in, in that chapel, if Jovert had come in, he would have killed him. He would have killed him. <clears throat> but because of all of the transformation that occurred over time, of reaching out and offering grace to a little girl who has no mom, reaching out and taking care of her mom because she was so sick, reaching out to other people around him and caring for them by his factory. All of that changed from that one moment of grace. Everything changed after that. And that's a remarkable story to, to pay attention to. So, all right, we will leave it there. I have more. I'll have it for you. Remember Wednesday's groups? Okay. Um,
and and so we'll we'll be doing this one one day a week at a time from here on out. So you know where to go, you know where to what to see. Good luck. <laughs>